Hello, fellow translators. Hello, everyone. This is a uh, very special video because I am here with a real life interpreter. Uh, over the years, I've received many uh, questions about interpreting because I talk about translation and obviously they're both related. Unfortunately, I'm not an interpreter. And so I always have to say, sorry, I can't really reply or I try to reply to the best of my abilities, but not being an interpreter, I'm really not qualified to know anything about this, but an interpreter does know these things. And so today we're gonna to talk to an interpreter. We're gonna to talk to Roland Palaret. That's right. That's correct, okay. And uh, he is an interpreter uh, working at the UN. It's the real deal. He is uh, both English and Serbian and also has a degree in Russian languages from St. Andrews in Scotland, I believe. That's and, right, that's right. Yeah, and so, and I'll, I'll let him introduce himself and give uh, his uh, brief background of his story. Um, but uh, just briefly, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. You're welcome, you're welcome. And I'm basically gonna be asking you the questions that I've been asked over the years and over time. And so hopefully uh, if there are any people out there who are interested in interpreting and uh, who are curious about this profession or would like to know more about it, hopefully this video will help them out. And, I hope so. Um, I should also let you know that uh, Roland has his own YouTube channel called The Interpretation Station, uh, which is very interesting. He Oh, wow. I don't, I, merch. Come on. Got to have your merch, haven't you? Yeah, I know. I don't have any merch. That's, yeah, good thing. Well, you should do with 7,000 yeah. subscribers. <laughs> I know. You'd think, yeah, I, I would have, I will get my act together that way. No, that's, but uh, definitely check out his channel. He definitely it goes into the nitty gritty of uh, specific issues uh, within the UN and uh, within um, the world. I mean, and, you know, things that are affecting uh, current events right now. And, uh, and it, it is extremely interesting and it's uh, definitely above my pay grade, but uh, very enlightening. So feel free to check out the interpretation station. I will have a link to it down below. And, uh, but for now, thank you for joining me once again. And, uh, and to start out, if you could just briefly go over your story, how you got into interpreting and, um, and yeah, how you got to where you are now. Absolutely. So, I mean, just before I start, I just want to make it absolutely clear that, you know, everything that I say here is it, the, the exclusive the, the opinions of basically of the interpretation station, okay? Anything I say, it's a personal opinion. So, yes, I, I, I do work for the UN, but any opinions expressed here are purely uh, my own. Um, so, yeah, as you say, I work, at, I work at the UN. I've been working there for <clears throat> about 11 years, started in 2009. So the languages that I work from is I work from Russian, Spanish and French into English. So I guess the, maybe the UN is a bit unusual. It's one of the, an organization which works mainly, the interpreters work mainly uh, into their mother tongue. They don't, they don't go the other way. Not entirely, but I'll maybe come to that a bit later. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I studied the way I got into interpreting um, I was always very good at languages, so I was, uh, my mother is Serbian, so I got brought up bilingually, and I studied uh, Russian, Russian and international relations uh, at university. So I guess I should have actually been on the other side of the screen, actually, with those qualifications. But the thought of being a diplomat never really sort of floated my boat, to be honest. And then, um, anyway, after graduating, uh, I was living in Serbia for a time. I was teaching, working, working, doing some translating work, working for a TV channel there. And I could see that, you know, languages, you know, languages is what I've always been good at. And to be honest, the thing that really spurred my uh, desire to work for the UN was that I had a kid. That's always a good thing to <laughs> <laughs> to kickstart you into taking life more seriously. Yeah. So, uh, so I applied to take the uh, happened. There had to be a UN uh, competitive exam going on in about 2006. So I thought, what the hell? I'll apply for that. See what happens. Uh, now the thing is, it was six years had passed since I'd actually graduated. I hadn't really used my language as much in that time. Not that much. Serbian, yes, but the Russian, the French, not so much. But anyway obviously tick the right boxes uh, in that, you know, in that application. And I guess they had to invite me to take the, the exam. So I suddenly got a letter and okay, you've got two, the exams in two weeks. I thought, bloody hell, uh, better start revising, hadn't I? So I started revising madly for two weeks. And obviously I went to the exam and failed utterly because it's, you know, you, you can't just suddenly relearn all that sort of stuff in the space of two weeks. Right. But, 
anyway, I reckon, you know, I've, I've laid the groundwork, at least it's starting to come back to me a little bit. And so I sort of took a decision, okay, every day from now on, I am going to watch alternately one hour's TV in French, one hour's TV in Russian. And I mean, properly watch it like the news. I'm going to sit down with a dictionary and I'm going to watch and the words, I don't know, I'm going to look them up, I'm going to look them up. And I started doing this obsessively almost. Uh, my wife was getting really sick of it because uh, I would force her to have to watch uh, the Russian news or the French news that she couldn't understand, obviously. And so anyway, I started trying to interpret as well. I started practicing at home, seeing if I could do it. And by the time the next exam came around, which was in 2008, I actually started, was quite confident by this point. So I went and took the exam and felt good after it as well. Felt pretty good. And then a couple of months later, got the letter saying, you know, thanks, but I'm sorry, you did you, thanks, but no thanks, basically. I was like, ah, gutted. Anyway, work, carried on working. And then a couple of months later, so now we're looking at sort of spring 2009, uh, I got a letter from the UN saying we are holding an internship course in the summer uh, for borderline fails, people who just missed. Uh, we're going to we're going to pay you like a, a P1 salary. Uh, you, would you like to come to New York for one month and do that? And um, yeah, well, by, by by this point, actually, well, I think my 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 daughter was about six months old at this point. I thought that sounds a good idea. That sounds yeah. like a really good idea. So I went to New York for that one month intense training course on how to, on being an interpreter. And at the end, the last day, I took what's called the UN freelance exam, passed it. Got taken into the big boss's office. Roland, would you like a six month free freelance contract in New York starting in December? I said, yes, I think I'll take that. And the rest is history. So I worked like two years doing like these six month contracts at the, in, in New York. 2011, I took the competitive exam for the third time. Uh, passed, obviously, by this point, I don't know, you know all the practice I needed. And that's when I took the, uh, that's when I became what they call the UN fonctionnaire. That's when I became sort of full time staff. So, and yeah. And so I worked. Still, I was working in New York until 2017, and in 2017 I moved uh, here, where I am now, to Geneva, the UN uh, in Geneva. That's right. basically more or less my story. Well, uh, uh, a couple of things. First of all, when so when you moved to New York, this was with your family then, or yep. was it just you? Okay. No, no. With the so that one month the internship, I was by myself. Right. But then, then when I got the offer of the lo longer contract, that yeah, we all moved more up sticks and. Moved to New York. Oh, in, uh, interesting. And uh, actually, I was curious also about the um, target and source languages, because usually for translation, they tell us for written translations that we should write, uh, we should translate into our native language from, you know, whatever other language you learn into our native language. I'd always heard that often for interpreting, it's the opposite, but it seems like the UN, that's how they operate as well. I'd say in, uh, for the most part, it's what, they, what most organizations, companies, is, is both ways. Right. But just the way that the UN uh, is structured, this is the way that I guess it seems to make most sense because you have, so at the UN, you've got six official languages, okay? You've got English, French, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, and Arabic. So I think it was initially five. I think they added Arabic, I believe, uh, in the 1970s it's like one of the only two times they've actually changed the un charter was to allow a new language arabic I, I, if i'm not mistaken they oh, don't wow. change the charter very often so it was to actually yeah. add the, allow the additional language and so in uh so in the english french spanish and russian booths you have this system we go into our own language and then you have the chinese and arabic booths uh where they go both ways actually uh so chinese oh they can actually so when I say go both ways, English Chinese or French Chinese, although there's only that's a there's a, there's a rare, that's a rarity. Right. In the Arabic booth, it's much more common though, uh, either French into Arabic or English into Arabic. That makes sense. And but and so there they they will go in both directions in uh, for oh, Arabic and Chinese. Yes, they, they go. In, so they're actually working the whole time. They're sort of on on duty. They're working 
the, 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 full, uh, the full amount of time. So actually they have, whereas in our, like in the four uh, European booths, I guess you'd say, there's just two of us working in a standard meeting. In the Arabic and Chinese booths, you've got three of them working. Because as I say, in our booths, we were off, you know, we're not always on mic, but they are always on mic. And so they need a extra pair of hands or extra set of tonsils, if you like. Right. So, I mean, and why, why is this the case? Is this because they have few, fewer people in those languages and so they need to go both ways or? I think it probably is. I think it's a question right. of supply and uh, supply and demand. It's just what, what makes mo most sense. I mean, as I say, with, with the Arabic, it's a very strict thing that they need. You know, it's about 50-50 those going to French and, 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 and English because of the sort of history of uh, the Middle East, the Arabic speaking world, obviously had a big French influence. Uh, the Lebanese and whatever. Whereas, I don't know, with the, with the Chinese, I guess you just don't have many, I guess you just don't have many sort of Europeans, if you like, whose Chinese who are, are simply that good enough or whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's just how the way they work it. Yeah, it makes sense. No, it's the same for written translations. It's rare to be able to find people who can translate directly French or Italian or something like that into Chinese. And, and right, that. right. Um, okay, so... Uh, for, I'd, right now, I'd like to ask you some questions about interpreting in general, and uh, and then later we'll get back to the UN specifically. But uh, because the questions, most of them I've, that have been, I mean, all the questions I've been receiving have been about interpreting in general. So mm -hmm. I'd like to kind of get your uh, your opinion and uh, your viewpoint on uh, on some of these questions. Sure. Uh, so first of all, is interpreting becoming more remote? Obviously, we've had twenty twenty. Yeah. And uh, where everything's been remote, but uh, do you see this as uh, a trend that is likely to stick or not? And I guess remote here could also mean people working from home or people going to a, an interpreter's booths and dealing with a meeting elsewhere or something, something along those lines. I think at certain levels, probably yes. Now that a lot of this technology has been introduced, I think it's inevitable that it's probably going to get used more. Um, I mean, do you want me? To, I mean, at the, so I mean. For example, uh, at, the, uh, at the UN, um, so they've had to use this, you know, as you know, while people are sort of in lockdown, while everyone's in confinement, yeah, that they have been using these platforms, you know, that you probably know them, Kudo, Interprefy, Interactio. Uh, so, yeah, what else is Zoom, WebEx, whatever. Right. So they, they don't really have much choice. Uh, for example, here in Geneva, We've been quite lucky, actually, and so where's I still I still go into work. Actually, I I still go, and I've been going into the to work since the summer, to be honest, since October, August or September. Um, there were at one point actually some meetings going on uh, in the in the in the rooms, uh, but at the moment, the now, now it's virtually all the situation. The situation is where we're in the booths, but the meeting takes place on the platform. Okay, so I don't know. Where it's like a sort of like a hub. You go in, and then we do our thing. But the actual meeting, there's, there was maybe the, the, the meeting I was in today. The del the chairman was actually in the room. He was there, but everything goes um, via the platforms. Now I believe in the other duty stations where the sort of the measures have been sort of much tougher, and, and where the interpreters just haven't been able to get into the building so they've been doing it in what is called dispersed mode where people are actually uh, working from their homes so what we're doing is called hybrid what they've been doing is dispersed uh now the general response i, th I think you get very much get the feeling from the delegates however that they are itching for everyone to get back into the room you know the problem is it's very it's very unreliable this whole system uh you have all the problems, the audio, on, on, our, on our side, you have all the problems, the health, pro related health problems, because as I say, the, the quality of the audio coming in is often very, well, it's very unpredictable. Right. I know people have been complaining of, I think it's called tinnititis a lot, just these sharp, you know, these right, when you're yeah. working here, you get these sort of sharp, sudden audio, acoustic shocks and things. And then you have this constant interruptions, the line goes dead. So my guess is that once things get back to normal, hopefully they will, that it'll more or less go back to the way it was, at least sort of in international organizations. Now, in the private market between businesses, I, I mean, 
I'm, I'm sure that the remote will, will get used more, but I mean, the, pro the big problem is, you know, the thing with the bandwidth with so many, and they can't guarantee the, the smooth, consistent quality of sound. Right. Okay, so when people, if someone is looking for an interpreting job, do you think now, again, excuse my ignorance, because uh, yep. for interpreting, I'm not sure how it works. Do you think it's better if they apply, you know, and say, when they're applying, if they apply for free, like they say, I'm available freelance, you know, whenever you need me, or if they try to get in-house jobs and in, uh, with the company, or will it completely depend? I mean, at this point, you just, I mean, I, I, I did a bit of homework because I don't really know the freelance market that well because I pretty much just went straight into in-house, which right. is, that's one of the quirks actually of, of having Russian in your combination. Uh, at the UN, you see there's a big, it's strange, but there's a big demand for Russian uh, and a limit, very pretty low, supp low supply. Um, so I sort of got in, I guess you might say, by the back door. I didn't go to, and have formal education interpreting. I never did a formal interpreting master's. Um, but um, I think for the most part, at this point, you've got to accept anything you're given. So the freelancers I was talking with when doing my homework was, yeah, I mean, you just you just have to take whatever's going right now. Right. And, and actually, I mean, you're yeah, like, uh -huh. at least for 2020, and then, you know, uh, the, it's, it's pretty much the same for translation. And it's unlikely you're going to just walk into an in-house post without some prior experience. Okay. Certainly in the, in the mainstream, yeah, in the mainstream language combinations, you know, you need to sort of make your bones first before, uh, before you get in house generally. Huh. Interesting. And so along those lines, what are some qualifications or attributes that make a good interpreter as in what, what should, if someone's interested in being an interpreter, um, mm -hmm. what's something they should be working on right now so that they can be ready, maybe not right away, but in a year or two, you know, something they can work on. Mm -hmm. and improve. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just really practice, practice, practice. Um, that's, that's why, that's why I did just forcing, you know, starting off with watching, I was watching TV, right. And then in my head, trying to interpret what the news reader is saying and just, just constantly, um, just trying to improve your language, you know, just trying to improve your, vo widen your vocabulary. By the way, I mean, the fact that you might sort of speak also two or three languages fluently doesn't automatically mean you're going to be a good interpreter, which is, which is right. a, might sound strange, but um, so there's a certain, yeah, your brain has to be wired in a certain way to be actually able to, to, to do that. Um, but I think you've just got to accept, you know, you've just got to take uh, so what, as I say, the people I was talking to is, you know, take all the jobs going, be it interpretation or translation, for example, take up take translating jobs, you know, make your, make your sort of name known, sort of net, you've got a network, and then you've got all these other sort of, ex, sort of qualities or attributes that you need uh, when you're interpreting, you need to be very sort of adaptable, you need to be resourceful. <laughs> We're working these, with certain languages, you need to have a very thick skin as well. Um, right. You need to make sure that, you know, you don't take things too much to heart. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, what I refer, so some of the, the Russian delegations, for example, you, you often get monitored by certain delegations. And so they will correct, if they don't like something, they, they will correct you. Oh, wow. And the important thing is you don't take that personally. You just got to right. keep on, you got to keep going. Um, so yeah that, that that's those are sort of attributes let's say that you need for to be an interpreter just practice just you to keep just improving your quality okay uh, what about um experience in translation would that help or would that not change much if, they, if i think if, i think it certainly helps because it expands your vocabulary i mean the impression i get is so i've done i used to do translate i used to do translating when i was in serbia i used to do translating i used to do uh, proof proofreading and the thing is with translation, obviously you've got much more time to prepare a text right. and you can use uh, much more, so we say exotic vocabulary. You really, you can give yourself, you know, you can think about exactly how you're going to reflect this um, idea. I mean, I, I remember translating, I translated a book when I was in Serbia. It was about the, um, that was the longer, biggest project I had. And it was about the, uh, the uprising in Belgrade in 1941, 
so the, so, the, so Yugoslavia had signed a pact, you see, with the Germans. And then there were huge protests broke out uh, in the center of Belgrade, instigated, they say, probably by the British, I must admit. <laughs> and uh, what happened, and then they overturned, uh, what, what basically kicked the government, they, they kicked the government out and they kicked the royal family, the Yugoslav royal family out. And so I was asked to uh, translate this book by, um, so by the, so there was a Prince Regent serving at the time in Serbia at that time. He was the main, he was the head of state. So this was his daughter actually uh, oh. that had asked me to translate that book. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if it ever got published in the end. I don't know, but I mean, I certainly remember, you, as I say, when you're translating a book, something like that, uh, it's called, it's, yeah, you have much more time to think what you're going to say. It, it was called The Truth About the 27th of March. That, that's what it was about. Okay. That was the date of that uprising. Whereas interpreting, it's a bit different, actually. In interpreting, you're often, you're looking for shortcuts, to be honest. You're looking to reflect an idea in the, short, in the shortest amount of time possible, using the fewest words possible, 95, 99% of the time. Oh, interesting. Some, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a different skill. It's not. It's a yeah. It's. I think maybe translators. Maybe the. I think translating. As I say, you maybe have a wider vocabulary that you can draw on. Whereas, we interpreters, we often just have to grab what's what's nearest, what's closest to hand, but just make sure the meaning is there. Right, and and I feel that's a big reason why I, I don't think I could be an interpreter for precisely that reason. Also, I'm not very good at thinking on my feet, and I like the the idea that I can try to perfect the text, you know, convey what yep. I want to convey in the way I want to convey it and keep working on it as long as I need to. Well, yeah, obviously interpreting, you need to be able to do it on the fly. And, yep. uh, and yeah, that, that's what I try and teach. I mean, I don't know if I'm about to sort of plug my channel here, but that's actually what, um, if you go and see, watch my channel, any potential interpreters, that's what I try and teach the tricks, or, you know, I teach, try and teach you how, how exactly to do that. Right. And uh, yeah, because it's uh, it it's definitely seems like yeah, a skill that to me at least seems quite daunting in a way to right. be able to do that. Um, so, what are in in terms of what an interpreter needs? Yeah, so like th these uh, qualifications and attributes help, but are there other things like just in terms of say software? Uh, you know, I have to, I'm I'm part of the board of the Carolina Association of Translators and Interpreters. And I noticed you can always tell the interpreters because they, like you, have really good headsets and uh, and uh, <laughs> microphones, and I just have this. Um, but uh, you know, is there are there certain things that an interpreter would need, or are these usually provided by an employer? Um, this, this this is standard issue, to be honest. So this was I, we, I didn't have this. If, actually, if you look at the first few episodes that I did, I, I was using earphones like yours. Right. And then when in about December or November, then it looked there was like a real danger of it being fully locked down. So then they started to issue us with all the gear. Oh. Um, yeah, that, that's the only reason I, I use, I've got these, the, 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 these earphones. I think in general, the, the employer will, I don't know, will they provide, actually, you know, I suppose if you're on the freelance market, you're probably your best bet is to make sure you've got your own gear in that respect, earphones. Okay. Um, you want these ones. So apparently I'm told that these have acoustic shock protection. Um, wow. That's like an, when it comes to equipment. I mean, I don't know, do you want me to say what make they are? I don't, I, oh, sure, I guess, yeah, I don't, I mean. I mean, they're, they're called Jabra. I mean, I think they chose those because if, I think if you look up on a search on YouTube, like uh, best mic for interpreting, the first search item comes up as Jabra. So probably someone just thought, all right, we'll get them then. Right. Um, so but apparently, yeah, they've got acoustic shock protection and uh, they, you have to have a built-in mic as well. That's the other crucial thing right, if you're going okay. to do one of these things and an ethernet connection i believe is also yeah. something that uh, you really need if you're going to be doing it from home and is there any type of software or, or do you just need to be able to see and hear or is there are are there programs or is there a type of software for interpreters that you use in the industry or not i mean again i'm sort of speaking a bit from secondhand experience from people i talk to so i think the, the companies these agent you know these uh, the platforms, your kudos, your interpretifies. I think they supply the 
boxes, uh, if, if from what I understand. Right. Or alternatively, I also heard that you know another alternative is that they have in certain cities what well, hubs where you basically just pitch up. You, if you've got, they, they it sounds like they are becoming the middleman uh, for a lot of the jobs. Right. Uh, the agent almost, and from what I hear, there's you know you go there to their hub, and you get put in a booth, and then they patch you into the meeting, and and you work. That's what I've again. This is what I've heard from other people. Right. Oh, and that could be interesting. Yeah, especially nowadays, they might they probably have yeah could act like go betweens for finding jobs and finding translators. This or, this is I mean, if you go to their site, you know, it's all also you know it's all mat seems to be a lot of matchmaking sort of going on between the the customer and the interpreter, whatever. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, no, interesting. Yeah, like I said, this is a different world from mine. Um, so as an example, I like to get into a hypothetical here. Let's say that I am, uh, I'm a person in Brazil. I'm fluent in Portuguese yep. and English. I've interpreted uh, for friends. I've interpreted maybe for the job that I have or the school I'm in on an ad hoc basis. And, uh, but I would like to start pursuing this as a real job um, and, and as a real career. What are some preliminary steps you would recommend taking at this point okay. in time? I practice, I assume, is one of them. That's the big one. I mean, right. one thing that okay. people tend to say is that quality will out in the end. I mean, there's a lot of competition, but if you are really good at it, the chance, and if you keep taking the, taking the jobs, accepting the jobs, that you will advance. Um, oh, but so... Yeah, if, like what sort of steps you can take. I guess it sort of varies from country to country, right? But so let's say in, in, in Britain, so you have what's called a, a diploma. Uh, it's called for public, a, a diploma of public service interpretation, uh, which is like a state exam that, that, that you can go and take. And uh, with, if you pass that exam, uh, it's, it's issued by the... It, Institute of Linguists, apparently. Again, I'm again I'm telling what I've, I've, my research, right. of my research, and that allows you to work uh, in the police, the courts, or the hospitals. Okay. Um, so, for example, if you're I don't know in, in the UK, uh, you could you, you could do that, and then you could hopefully if you pass it, you can get some jobs, and then I believe it, with that sort of diploma. There's an equivalent one for translation as well. That's called a DPST, same thing, public service interpretation. I believe that you can go then to one of the universities, let's say. And uh, if you're over the age of 25 in Britain, you can uh, apply to be a, as a mature student. Okay, and that, so that, uh, that diploma sort of serves as your credentials, okay, that you've, you've passed that. Uh, state exam and that right. you have I guess got some potential to be an interpreter and then you can you know get into one of the school the universities uh, and and uh, take that route I'm told that in uh, in, in America I was uh, I had a colleague who was telling me um, the community interpreting um, where you become apparently there's there's, there's three levels uh, there's the community level, is the bottom level, there's the court interpreting is the sort of second level, and then you've got the top level is like conference interpreting. And so if you were to compare the levels involved, it's a, it, to use a musical analogy, so like the community interpreting is like rock and roll. So anyone could basically play rock and roll, right? You don't have to be a great singer, great musician, you can do rock and roll, you know? Uh, the court interpreting is like jazz, but you do actually need to have some sort of proficiency, a bit of skill. And the conference interpreting is like the classical musician, which is really, you know, does require a lot of um, high level training. Um, so, I mean, that's what I know of in, in, the, in Britain and the UK. Now, I, I know in continental Europe, for example, the thing to become is like a sworn court interpreter or translator, um, which again, it's similar. I think you, you take like a state, the sort of state uh, exam to try to try and get that um, diploma. But I think the main thing is, you know, if you want to do it, you just keep practicing and practicing and practicing and be willing, be willing to accept anything that really comes your way. 
and then right. try and start taking those, uh, try and get your hands on those diplomas, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And get those qualifications and yeah. use those to uh, keep getting ahead. So make your way up the ladder. Yeah. And so like these exams that are offered, at least in the, in the UK, are they in all the main language combinations or? I believe so. I mean, I think for loads of language combinations, because okay. I think of, obviously uh, at the lower levels, maybe you're working, there's lots of sort of immigrants going through the system, you know, through the hospitals and things. So I think there's a wide, there's a wide variety of lang languages involved. I seem to remember also once when I was in New York, just looking through for the New York State uh, community interpreter exams. I, you know, there's, there's a wide, wide uh, spectrum uh, of languages there. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and then there's another thing actually, uh, another form of interpretation, chuchotage. I don't know right. if you've heard of chuchot, like the whis you know, the whispering. Uh, in, that's that's like a court thing where where the, I know a defendant's being questioned and you're standing behind him, pretty much giving simultaneous whispering. Um, apparently, that I'm told that is rather difficult. It's quite stressful. But, uh, yeah, so that's my impression. Actually, and I was going to ask this later, but let me ask yeah. this now. Uh, do you think it's um, should people, as as far as I can tell, you have consecutive interpreting, simultaneous interpreting, and chuchotage. Yeah, uh, and should people be trying to specialize in because they seem they can be quite different especially between consecutive and simultaneous and yeah i mean i guess all three can be quite different should people be specializing in one or usually you kind of end up where you end up or how does it work well the vast majority is simultaneous actually oh, it is. the vast okay. majority i mean the consecutive is just sort of uh here and there and uh I can't. I, I, I've never been. I've never done consecutive interpreting. I have to say, I've never been trained. If you, trained in it, if you go to one of the schools, one of the universities, you get trained. Your part of your training as an interpreter is in consecutive. But uh, I, I have never actually done it, and uh, oh, wow. it does almost seem like a skill unto itself because apparently the, the you know the your, your consecutive interpreter can basically do a half hour stint. I was told. So you're basically taking notes for half an hour from the speaker. And then you just speak off from from those notes. It's, I mean, it sounds like an oh, interesting wow. skill, actually. Yeah. But so as I say, I, I have never done it, but um, oh, I didn't realize that. I always figured yeah. it was a, a sentence or two at a time, and then this is what I thought until yesterday evening. Actually, oh. <laughs> I mean, I knew it was a bit more than a sentence at a right. time, but I didn't realize that that bloody long. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, that would take a considerable skill, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the vast majority then is usually simultaneous. A vast majority is, is, is simultaneous, yeah. And this and this would be whether you're working in a corporate setting or in um, any, anything. International yeah. organizations, yeah, exactly. Yeah, or courts or stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, I suppose that chuchotage is sort of like simultaneous, pretty much. Right. Well, okay. And actually, could we go a bit more? So what is the difference between chuchotage and simultaneous. I have sort of well, an idea, but it'd be better, mm, yeah, if you could explain it, I guess. I mean, simultaneous is you're just in the booth. You're, you're just in a right. booth in a conference, you know, with all okay. the technology, the, everything, all the setup and things. Whereas the, I think the, the chuchotage, from what I gather, is you're, as I say, you're in court standing behind the defendant and you're just whispering, you know, whispering, saying, basically trans interpreting what the judge is saying and having to deal with all the surrounding noise and things, apparently, yes, it's, it's apparently not that easy. Um, right. Simultaneous is just you're in the booth. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah my, my impression was exactly, you're doing it just for this one person and it's yeah. almost yeah. not off the record, but yeah, just private for yeah. them, right. Yeah. Um, okay, and um, so, so yeah, we've covered it. And our, while we're on this subject actually is, um, are there any, how would I put this? Are, are there any tips you would have, you know, to try to get ahead of the pack, try to get well known? Are there other things that can maybe help you stand out from the pack or uh, that maybe can catch someone's eye in the interpreting world that maybe aren't yeah. as obvious to a beginner? Um, having a B language is always a good one. Oh, you know what? Do you, do you know what that, I mean by that? Uh, no. <laughs> So uh, like, is it having another so a language that you can interpret into which isn't your native language right okay and, so um, i mean uh, so, so that you can you go have one of these 
I like don't Russian. actually know. Well, oh, I have okay. Serb Serbian would you know Serbian would be my B language actually. Okay, okay. That's my sort of second language. But uh, for Russian, French, and Spanish, for me, they're all, they're all C languages. So I can only interpret into English. French, I could probably do both ways, you know. But officially, they're, they're C languages. So so a B language is uh, is one that you can work into, even though it's not your mother tongue. And I'd say that that's a that will definitely give you a sort of leg up um okay. it makes you much more attractive uh that's one thing makes you much more attractive on the industry because i think the the majority of jobs even in international organizations a lot of them have the, the b rather than they just have the what the one booth going both way both ways right um so that's that's one thing uh another thing well have have more languages okay? i mean just have more languages that you can offer because if you just have like the standard you've just got this, I don't know, spanish and french into english you're gonna have a hell of a lot of competition and to really get right. a lot of work you need or i don't know if you want to, to work at the big in, the organizations you really are going to have to be at the very top to to, to get that where uh, so if you have more languages if you add more languages that's going to make you more more attractive i mean the obvious one you know if you've got spanish and french maybe to add portuguese or add italian that the, you know the, the it's not that difficult to add another romance language for example right um or if you're younger perhaps if you're earlier in your career um add a, a maybe an exotic language um, uh, for, because you're going to have less competition there. If you right. really want to work, if you really want to work at the UN, you get uh, learn Russian. If you're oh, from I the see. English-speaking world or French, is particularly, and you want to, you really want to work for the UN, learn Russian. At least be able to work from Russian into English, um, because, like I say, that that's what sort of that's what worked for me. Uh, and then other than that, I mean, I don't know, in the future, I've got a feeling it's going to be handy. I think pretty, knowing Chinese is, that, you know, 10, 15 years down the line is going to be, a, a, I, I'm going to start like uh, my kids. I think I'm going to start giving, getting them Chinese lessons starting from next year, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to be one of the language, inevitably going to be perhaps one of the languages of the future. So th those would be really my tips just yeah either add yeah. a b or learn another language that you can work do as a c yeah right so and, and just to get this straight so a would be your native tongue and a language yep. b language would be not your native tongue but you can translate into or you yep. can interpret into and interpret into, yeah. c languages are languages you interpret from right exactly okay. and then you have lots of to be honest i get the feeling like in the states like in new york I think you must have a ton of what I call A minuses. You know, you hear on the like on the subway, you have all the Latinos and things. Right. You hear them talking and they're sort of jabbering, they're jabbering away in English and then pero, blah, 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 in yeah. Spanish, and then they swing back into English. Uh, so they strike me as all be lots of A minuses. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, yeah, that's interesting. You find different variations. I mean. Well, and, and also I'm wondering because I know it's the same in translation. If you're dealing with some of the main languages, then it's really difficult to get to the top or to get yeah. noticed, quite frankly, at the beginning. And uh, so you need to find a way or either find exactly your niche or, yeah, try to go into a less well-known language. But one thing you can do in translation is sometimes go for the dialects because you do have literature and various dialects that can be translated to or from. Mm -hmm. But I get the impression that for interpreting, that wouldn't so much be the case. Because um, farmers up in you know somewhere, maybe again this might be a sort of very com you know I was talking earlier about the community level, as I say right. maybe if you're working with like my immigrants whatever who really yeah who some of these sort of uh, maybe African languages I don't um, these sort of I'm trying to think what some of them are called you might get some work there for example right. uh, but generally the dialects I mean you got all the different dialects of I guess you've got the different dialects of, of Arabic and that might come in helpful, oh, yeah. I guess. Again, again, a sort of community level for people in hospitals and the courts that might, might be useful, but okay. to get really higher up the chain, uh, it's probably, yeah, I think that it's a lot of limited sort of the community level. 
Right. Okay. No, I was thinking more along the lines because most places have their, so I grew up, you know, in the Italian part of Switzerland where they speak Italian, but they also right. have their Ticino dialect mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, and they're trying to promote it more. And there's, you know, so you do find actually probably more literature now be, than before in this dialect. And so translating to and from this dialect is actually something that um, is probably, you know, you see a bit more of now than before, mm. but I imagine interpreting that wouldn't be the case. At least Not really, because I mean, the translation is more, you could, but there's more an art focus, isn't there, in translation, people wanting these books or whatever right. literature translated, whereas with the spoken word, it tends to be more a case of expediency yeah. rather than art. Okay, yeah, exactly. That was my impression as well. And, and so, yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Um, so, in terms of, you know, talking about the UN, let's say, uh, once again, if someone, because you, you got there in a, in a very interesting way, um, uh, this, is, is, there, is there a typical way to get into the UN or is, um, does it really, if someone would, let's, what I'm trying to say is if someone is interested in joining the UN or organization similar to that, um, is there a standard way that they usually get there or does it, can it really depend? I'd say that it's pretty standard generally for the most okay. part, you know, in each sort of region, there is sort of a, a pyramid that you sort of climb up, you know, you get your, your undergraduate degree, for example, containing a, a language. And from there, from that, that point, then you might think to yourself, all right, I'd like to be an interpreter or translator, whatever. And then you are, then you take the master's. And then once you've got the masters, then you've got, yeah, that really is your ticket to ride. And at that point, you know, you, you can start accepting. It's very, it's unlikely that you would go immediately into uh, one of the big organizations, but you're going to start getting offers, hopefully. Uh, you start accepting work. And as I say, you build up, uh, you build up a sort of good record. And then these organizations like the UN, every few years, they have like a, an accreditation exam, a competitive exam, be it for, so they have a freelance competitive, the freelance exam where you get freelancer accredited, which means that they can call you up when, when you know, when they're short of staff. And then obviously the top level is the, uh, the competitive uh, staff exam, where at that point, then you can become, uh, then if there's, you can become full time if there's positions that open up you're in with a shot of getting that full time and with the mainstream languages that is very much the the standard way to go you know if you as i say if you've got like english and french into english there's no other way really to to get in um other than taking that sort of traditional path and i think with the other you know for the i think uh, with the, the the arabic i think it's the same i think there's a uh, the say there's you know you have to go to the university and then you go to a, a sort of graduate school whatever and they're the sort of feeders for the international organizations it's just there are the there is the occasional sort of uh exception like sort of like myself where you are able there are some you know there are pathways for certain uh for certain languages for, right yeah. and because you, exactly your situation seems to be quite an exception and so do you think they just it it was happenstance like serendipity you they really needed someone with your skills and you happen to be there or does it just happen randomly? yeah a, a bit i mean i'm not the only one who, who's got that who's got that okay. in my so i know other others at the un working from russian where it's just that there a bit, there's a bit more leeway for you, to be honest. There's a bit more leeway for you that if, you know, like I say, if you, sh you, you, if you can get onto that exam, for example, you know how I got on things, because I happened to have the, un I happened to have uh, the right university degree. I had an, an MA, so they had, they had to invite me. So you can sort of, you can get in there. And then if you show that you're pretty good, then you might, and if, they're at a point maybe they've had a few retirements or something um right then maybe you get lucky and yes i i got lucky 2009 everyone else was going to recession and i got lucky so <laughs> yeah i mean it happens that way sometimes yeah. Is, but uh, sorry that's in, so since you had an ma they had to invite you yeah because you mentioned yeah. that before they had to yeah, invite yeah, you yeah, to, yeah. so anyone who has an ma has to get invited if they apply? I, I think that was the case, yeah. I mean, because I think otherwise then they're liable to be sued, perhaps, sued perhaps 
is I, 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 I think, you know, oh. if you have all the things that are required, I mean, it's, you know, it's a government, it's the UN is a civil, you know, it's a, oh, right. a public sector organization. So you, if they just sort of arbitrarily say, now we don't want this guy, even though you have, even though you meet, even though you tick all the boxes, I guess that would probably make, the, you know, you, they could be sued. So this is just not worth it doing that they just let you come and take the exam and then you know if right you... I and mean, it makes sense I, I think i'm just too used to working for private corporations yeah right. where you, you never know why or how they right decisions that has, you need um, yeah they don't need to tell you why they don't want you yeah right. it's, it's, with an international organization yeah they, they they have to sort of follow the rules um so and i i need to ask this because uh when i was in korea i met a guy who does interpreting for movie stars when they go to visit and so he did interpreting for brad pitt angelina jolie and stuff like that and that seemed quite interesting as well if someone were interested in something like that i mean to your knowledge would uh is there anything specific they should be shooting for or is there a specific way to get into that type of interpreting I don't think that type of interpreting really exists as such. It's just, you know, whatever's going, whatever the agencies are, are offering. I think that's, I don't, I, I don't know of anyone myself who, who has had that, you know, sports interpreting has been, you know, I knew a guy who did work for FIFA and things, but again, FIFA's an, an international organization. Right. So, I mean, really it's the choice, the choice in, in as a career, it's really between, uh, do you want to work? Uh, do you want to be a staff interpreter, or do you want to be a freelancer? That's the big decision, right. uh, because what you find is, again, it's not a decision I really had to take; doesn't didn't really apply to me. But you'll find with with younger folks, so they come out of university with a degree, often it's more attractive. You know, they're young, free, and single. You get to travel a lot. You get you know conferences in different countries you get to see the world you get to do a wide range of different meetings or at least you did <laughs> and yeah. then uh, you know you build up your, your your knowledge you build up your experience then people who are a bit older got families then obviously it's more perhaps more attractive to take the staff position you, you're working more you work more as staff because you're full time but you obviously you get benefits very sort of perks and things um, I think maybe the freelancers perhaps earn can earn more. Um, yeah, if you, I think you know, if you really work, uh, you know, if you take everything that's going, you you can earn more. And as I say, you have the freedom. But yeah, if you're older, then you know, if you're a staff interpreter, you get the pension and whatever other right. sort of perks. So I'd say yeah. that's really the choice: freelance versus staff. And is it? easy or in, in terms of what you've seen like is it easy to switch from say if you have a great career as a freelancer to become in-house or vice versa it's very vice versa is very rare oh, so really? i mean with the going freelance to staff is very common i mean lots right. of my co most of my colleagues did that they started out freelance and then they got to a different stage in life they apply, they did the accreditation exams, whether for the UN or the EU, whatever, and then you hope you, hope you get the invitation. Right. It's very rare to go to the other way. I know of one guy, there is one guy who, uh, who was a staff interpreter at the UN, and he left just before I arrived in Geneva, and he actually, then he moved to, De I think he moved to Denmark or something, and he became, so then he, he worked as freelance. So he's, he's the only example that I know of that, that went the other way oh interesting okay no because i'm wondering if some people might want to eventually be freelancer but they'll say i'll work in-house for now and then later switch to freelance um just uh because it gives me more freedom or something but uh, i don't know if exactly it's unlikely because i think it's only because i think that guy was i think because of his wife's job it just she right. had a very good job as well so it just made more sense to do it that way but for the most part you know people want to become the staff interpreters because the security i mean especially yeah. like now it's pretty these days yeah grim being a freelancer i mean uh, i mean i don't there's just not as much work on the market as the at the moment and like being staff now it looks is very attractive i mean it's very uh, that's um, interesting because yeah for translation written translation i'd say it's almost the opposite i think well i think things were already progressing toward more freelance uh stuff but 
you know, after 2020, pretty much everything is freelance now. And um, so, I mean, things have just been heading that direction and uh, that's kind really, of what yeah. people are shooting for. Um, anyway, it's, uh, so actually be before we wrap it up, what are some things maybe, cause you said some things, you know, that can help you out. What are some things to watch out for or maybe red flags when, when looking for interpreters or hiring them, things you want to make sure you, I guess, don't have on your resume or you haven't done, or I don't know. Or does anything I mean, you guess you have got to do your due diligence, haven't you? You've got to check their credentials. I, it's, it's much harder, I think, to pull a fast one, perhaps, as a, an interpreter than a, a translator. I guess with, because a translator, I think, you know, you give a guy a job, like a translation, you can always go and ask his dad or his mate and he can maybe try and put something together that just about passes muster yeah but an interpreter an who's trying to pull a fast one i think he's going to be found out pretty quickly right on the job you know you can see pretty soon that the message isn't getting across well i'm i i think what made me also think of that was uh famously you had the um the sign language interpreter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you know what you're what I'm talking about. Mandela's yeah. funeral. Yeah, it was something. Yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, something big like that. Exactly. Yeah. I think it was Mandela's funeral. Yes, it was. In There's always America. a few that squeeze through the cracks, and right. I'm pretty sure that was the case. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and he was just making it up as he was going along. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. I and I guess obviously in common languages it's next to. I mean, I think in any language it's next to impossible, but I guess yeah. maybe with the rarer ones. But yeah. Someone um, didn't do their due diligence there. Right, that's yeah, for sure. definitely. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty much it. Is there anything else you'd like to add to, uh, you know, for people who are interested in interpreting? Um, but just go to my channel and learn how to do it. Because uh, yeah. the reason, I mean, the reason I started was, from what I could tell, was you, you have all these professions out there, right? And you can go on YouTube and you can pretty much learn, you know, the basics of being a mechanic. You can learn the basics of being an accountant, being the whole lots of things, but for interpreting, I mean, there's lots of good sort of channels, I mean, but there's none, that, as far as I could tell you, that, that shows you, it's, okay, this is what you actually have to do. This is how you interpret a text. This is how you break it down. Um, so that's what I'm, I, my aim is just to make the profession a bit more accessible to people, to give them the chance to, so that they can go and to YouTube search, okay, conference interpreting. So hopefully sometime soon, my channel will be at the top of the list and they can go to that and they right. can see, aha, uh -huh, that's what it involves. That's the sort of stuff that you need to do. Ah, uh, that's it. So you don't need to actually translate every single word that the speaker says. You can just sort of, you can sort of take these shortcuts and you can sometimes not even say some words at all. And so you don't need to, all those five adjectives that the speaker used, uh -huh. so you don't actually need to give a complete word for word interpretation, I don't, like you might in translation. So I don't know if, right. it, it, I take it in, in translation, you really want to get each word, right? Like it, it depends on the type, but certainly for like legal texts or stuff like that, you, yeah. you need to, uh, it needs to be very precise in that sense. Obviously in the more literature not, it's completely different, but yeah. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. So um, that's an interpretation you have. There's these tricks, there's the, the shortcuts and the, you know, the, the, the main thing is that you get that, the meaning. It's all about the meaning that you get right. across uh, to the listener. That's, that's the key. So yeah, that's, that's what I hope my channel can do. Yeah, and, and once again, I'll link to it down below. It's the interpretation station. Uh, show the logo again. That was. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. You see there that? You go. Oh, interpretation station. There, you go. Interpretation oh, there, station. there you go. Nice. There we are. And uh, I need to do. I'm, I know. Not only I don't have my logo, I'm I'm holding a cup with someone else's <laughs> logo on it. I should not be doing that. You've got to get. You've got to get some merch. So you can know. send me some merch. Once once you do it, you got to okay. send me. <laughs> I will. Yeah, I should. I should do that and just have it there. I even because I have a book and I think for one or two videos, I had it there in the background and I stopped with that as well. And <laughs> I should. Um, yeah, I, I should be doing stuff. I like got that. coasters as well for Christmas. So for Christmas, I got really lucky for Christmas. I got the bottle. I got coast little coasters. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you can. Uh, and that well, and, and that's smart, actually, the bottle, because you can exactly show it in all your videos like that. And that's that what I do. Yeah, and then, uh, that's I should uh, yeah I should look into that more. Anyway, 
I will link to the interpretation station uh, in the description below. Uh, everyone go check out the interpretation station, especially if you're interested in interpreting. If you know anyone interested in interpreting, send them there. Um, and I'm also uh, on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn as well. You can find me on LinkedIn. I just uh, added you. Either, yeah, in, yeah, that's right. So I'm either in my own name, but maybe I've got the, the, the interpretation station has its own LinkedIn account. So oh, okay. go and look me up on the interpretation station LinkedIn. Right. So, and if you have any questions of interpreting, feel free to ask him because, uh, you know. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then oh, something happened to my computer. Anyway, uh, we'll wrap it up right now. Once again, thank you so much. And uh, I will, uh, we'll talk next time. It's been a pleasure, Robert. Thank you very okay. much for having me on the show. Thank you. Thanks.